Hey, it's Lee. Welcome to Business Problem Solved today. I have the immense pleasure of welcoming back for the second time, Katie Anderson. Hello there, Katie. How the devil are you? Hi, Lee. It's great to be back talking with you today. Yeah, I'm well, I'm well made up uh, about this. So for those people who don't know who Katie Anderson is, I mean, why have they not listened to the first conversation? Um, but then who is Katie Anderson? That is a very profound question when phrased that way. Uh, who am I and who do I want to be? Um, I'm many, many things. I am uh, a coach, a consultant, an author of best-selling book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. Love it. A mom Love it. of two boys, um, currently age seven and 10. Uh, actually, a, well, not actually a wife, but I celebrated my 13th wedding anniversary yesterday at the time of this recording. Congratulations. So that's really yeah, thanks. And uh and a daughter to my two special parents. And I have a feeling we'll have a chance to talk about uh, my dad is um, later today. So I'll save some of that. And I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I've lived in six other countries and consider myself a global citizen. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What what a journey. And we in, in the first conversation, we spoke quite a, quite a length about your journey. Um, but do you see yourself as successful, Katie? You know, that's a, that's another great question. I, I, lo I love these questions. I I do see myself as successful, and uh, but the the concept of success I've had to redefine for myself at different parts of my career, and uh, in when I was in in academia as well. Uh, but how I consider myself successful right now is that I have a career that I love. I'm making the impact that I want in the world, uh, making the genuine human connections uh, with people globally. I'm able to. Uh, have you know be present for my family as well and um and achieve a lot of the goals that i've set out for myself but most importantly it's about being who i want to be and having success in um in showing up as the person i want to be and so that's how i consider success i actually had I, when i left the my last um uh, I went corporate world. I actually was working in healthcare, so it's hard to say it was the corporate world. <laughs> but my last internal role was eight years ago, this around the time of this recording. And I really had to redefine what career success meant for me at that point. Was it because before that it was always about, you know, getting to the next level and the next level, growing my team, growing my responsibility and my scope. Uh, and stepping out of that world and starting my own business, success had to take on a different meaning. Uh, and so that was a that was a readjustment in mindset. Um, but I'm really thrilled where I am. And um, despite the ups and downs, which is part of learning and moving towards goals, and um, I do feel like I am successful where I am today. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you for that. So learning to lead, leading to learn. Um, is that, that's the right way around, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I got perfect. I was going to learn. Learning, learning first, leading yeah. second. Yeah. Um, it's a year old. Yeah. And so I cannot believe it. It's July 14th will be the one year anniversary, or maybe you're listening after that. Uh, it was, the book was launched July 14th, 2020, in the midst of the early days of the pandemic, which was, you know, again, a different, <laughs> required a real shift in mindset and perspective about what a book release and a book launch was. And it's just been an amazing, an, an amazing journey and having the opportunity to really impact so many people around the world and all the positive reviews and messages that I've received from people. And I share that with Mr. Yoshino because you know the book is about his stories of learning and leading over 40 plus years at Toyota and his yeah. um, lifetime as well. And I'm really excited to be launching the audiobook as well um, this, this week of the anniversary too. This is well exciting. So the audiobook is, um, is, is out as well. Is that your own, is that your own tones? Are you, is that you speaking? It is. This voice that you hear right now is the voice that narrated. So I not only wrote the words of the book, I am reading the words of the book. And John Shook, who wrote the book's forward, narrated his forward. And Mr. Yoshino, the subject of the book, read his letter to the reader, as well as some select key quotes throughout the book as well. So it, it was really important to me that, that, you know, this book was our voices because this was such a personal story and the relationship of Mr. Yoshino and me to create this book. And the, we wanted the connection between us and the connection we can have with the audience as well. Yeah. So have you, was, have uh, you listened to the audio book? Have you listened back to it? I've listened to definitely uh, segments, but just, just like <laughs> for some quality control, just like it, I couldn't actually read the book for, <laughs> for <Yeah>. a while <laughs> um, because, you know, you have, 
just the, the number of times I read the book was a lot and, you know, it still pained me that even a few typos made it through, but uh, I have listened to some segments of the, the book for quality control and had, of course, many people uh, listen to it as well, yeah. my producer and, uh, and others. Um, you know, it's always hard to listen to your own voice, but it's important as well to uh, to hear what others are. It is, and but I, I always find it find it strange when authors get somebody else to read their book because, <laughs> um, and the reason the reason for it because you know the important words in the sentences that you've written, you know the um, the the the, um, the the context or the the intent with particular words. Um, I were you able to get that across uh, like you wanted to when you did the audiobook? Uh, well, well, I'll let, have to let the the listeners here <laughs> <laughs> tell me if they if they did. But yeah, yes, that was a certain that was definitely um, one of the many reasons I I chose to do the narration myself. Although, of course, then uh, as a writer, you're like, oh, I, that was a really challenging to say sentence um, in a few places. Like, oh, that was a run on. That was very hard to say. Uh, I also realized. Well, one of the interesting things, I haven't actually talked about this yet, so this is great with the questions. There, are, Through the book, there are many like block quotes of Mr. Yoshino. Um, so much of the book is my narration with like, you know, some small excerpts of, of direct quotes, but others are block quotes. And I needed to shift my my speech because he read some select quotes that started at the beginning of each chapter, but I was speaking in his voice in reading the book. And so how did it shift from the part that was me as the narrator versus me as reading a quote from Mr. Yoshino? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll be curious to hear how this lands with people. And I, I, I tended to speak in much more of this conversational tone that I'm having now with, with you. And I tried yeah. to slow down a little bit and maybe speak a little bit more no, no, low, not, not trying to speak too low, but like just slow down uh, when I was reading quotes from him. Yeah. So I, I found that reading books to my children actually prepared me really well <laughs> for narrating <laughs> an audiobook. I was like, oh, it's all these years of reading bedtime stories is coming to uh, coming to actually play a role in my career. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I mean, during your introduction, you mentioned the word connection. And the word that popped into my mind when you were you're talking about um, narrating your, your own book is, is, is connection again and connecting with the audience with the, with the right intent and, and things. Um, and we spoke just before we hit record about uh, our, our understanding or our, the, the importance of connection mm. to us. I'd just like to touch on that, actually. So yeah. what does connection mean to you, Kata? Mm, that's another great question, Lee. Thank you very you much. Know when I, can, I know you're asking all these <laughs> like like the the simple this is you know the the simple short questions are the the most effective and thought provoking ones so good on you <laughs> uh, yeah connection has really been a theme of my my life and it's about not necessarily quantity of time but but quality and you know I think I mentioned is like this sense of genuine human connection it's about having a shared experience it's about knowing that um, there's something we relate to and there's positive intent. Um, and, and that there, there's this sense of, you know, that respect for humanity element that we talk about in, in continuous improvement, we say respect for people, but I think it's this inherent actual sense of, um, a connection as, as human beings as well. And that's so important for how we show up, not only in our home lives and personal lives, but how we show up in work as well. And is really, to me, the foundation of leadership and of continuous improvement as well. How do you build that connection? Because I, I completely agree, connection is is key for everything. Like I, I was talking just before we, we hit record and I um, I mentioned that I've been on a stand-up comedy course and at the start of that comedy course, they said, what's the most important thing in comedy? And everybody sh chanted back jokes with the most, and you get, no, that's the third most important, that's the material. The actual most important thing is, is connection. And then it's your, your performance. So your performance is, um, is, is how you vary your, your setup and your punchline and the material is just, is just your material. Um, so how do you build connection? Mm. There are a lot of different ways. And I think one is really just being authentic and not trying to be sort of above someone and, and, and showing up as like, I'm a real human being as well. One of the things that I coach um, leaders and continuous improvement practitioners often on is that there can be this sort of 
unnatural imbalance that happens on a hierarchy when you know someone's in a quote unquote management or leadership role that that feels like oh I'm 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 higher than you just because of the org chart and that people maybe don't feel that same connection to to you so how do you have that humility and demonstrate that you actually don't see yourself as sort of better than someone else but that you're human that you make mistakes as well, that you're also a learner, that you're, while you have some expertise, you're not the only expert. And I think that those elements can really help us create connection. So even in comedy, I mean, you like, people are, you know, you, you, you poke fun at yourself, right? And you, yeah. you know, show that you're like a real human being and that you're, that real stuff happens to you as well. And I, I mean, I find those things as when I go, um, participate in comedy, you know, the, and that those are the things that connect to me too. It's the storytelling, it's the humanness, um, and not trying to be perfect. Yeah, I think what so I, I think that's just sparked a thought. So leaders have this. Uh, in my experience, a lot of leaders don't like to admit mistakes, show that they've um, that they are, are vulnerable and that they don't know the answer to certain questions. Um, do you do you find that in with some of the leaders that you work with and how do you start to break down those barriers yeah that's uh, absolutely you know i think we're 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 all groomed you know from like an early age in you know our schooling that we need to have the right answers that being successful going back to your original concept is ha is the one having the right answer and getting the 100% on the test and yeah. high achievement uh Yet actually, when we're in a leadership role, we, we shouldn't have all the answers or we're in the coaching role as well. We're, we actually definitely shouldn't have <laughs> all the answers. Our role is different. It's a, uh, leaders are there to set the direction, like where do we need to go, but then provide support to people about how, we're, how they are thinking we're going to get there. Um, and that's part of what I talk about uh, in the book as well. It, how, one of the things that I coach leaders on is that, you know, to be going back to this concept of a natural imbalance is how do you, how do you start leveling that balance? It can even be saying, and this can be very, feel very uncomfortable for many people, but I really encourage them to do it. Say like, um, for example, I'm, I'm here to, I want to ask you questions to help you think through this problem. This feels a little uncomfortable to me because I'm used to having all the answers, but I'm really going to practice asking some answers to you and, or ask, not asking answers, asking questions <laughs> to you. And at the end, I'm going to ask for your feedback. What was a helpful question that I asked? And people are like, oh, but I'm supposed to be the one, you know, with all the answers. So I know actually in this role, it's an about, and then the more you can acknowledge that you're learning or practicing some sort of leadership or coaching skill, it can help actually create a better connection, sense of trust. People feel more comfortable um, because it, you're a learner and a leader at the same time. And, um, and calling that out and, be, and labeling it and being transparent is so um, critical, again, to creating that connection and that trust. Yeah, uh, it completely, it's completely is. I was, um, I, I'm, I'm pointing at my back garden. I was, I was out there with my, uh, my, my eight-year-old the other, the other night and I was kicking the ball to him and he asked me to record some videos for YouTube. I saw this. He, he, yeah. He's an, <laughs> yeah, he's an aspiring footballer. And, and, um, and he... He did. He wanted me to delete all of the ones where I scored the goals, the ones where he missed the ball. He wanted mm -hmm. me to delete them, and and that made me really reflect about. It's just it. If he's like that now at eight years old, and leaders are like that now at whatever age the, the leaders are, it's 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 a bigger it's a bigger problem that we need to unpick and this 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 vulnerability. But then if we look at social media, the people that are social media influencers are the ones that have the the behind the scenes. Um, views and so because you're, you're trying to build that connection um, mm. with with people it all comes down to, to the human elements um, absolutely yeah I, I think that you know some of the feedback that I get the most about learning to lead leading to learn is how much people appreciate Mr. Yoshino's willingness to talk about his challenges and his failures and of course learning yeah. from the things that went well but also really deeply learning from his failures and being willing to share that with the world and be vulnerable and uh, just really connect with, connect with um, him more. And I think it opens up the learning because he was willing to, to, 
to be honest about the ups and the downs of leadership. Yeah, in fact, just a few minutes ago, you mentioned um, the, the questions that I was asking. And what, I, what makes a good question to be a good coach in, in, in your eyes, to, to enable somebody to learn? You know, I always talk about how the best questions are the ones asked, you know, it's around coaching and helping someone else. So asked with the genuine intent to help the other person think more deeply. And so uh, I think what's, what's the biggest challenge in that is that we are often trying to answer the questions that are going on in our heads. So how do we ask the more that they're short and simple and start with what and how, um, and, and really not assuming some sort of answer uh, or a question in disguise, like what have you thought of my great idea? <laughs> really those show like, you know, how do you define success? What does success look like for you? I'm, wow, okay, that's super open. You're not assuming anything about my answer there. Um, and you're asking with genuine curiosity to hear about what I'm thinking. Um, I, I try and highlight to people how often they're saying, well, I'm trying to understand. So I'm asking these questions because I want to understand where something's happening. Well, no, no, no. Actually, not, you're, you're going back to you here. How can you ask a question to help the other person better understand? And yes. uh, that it all gets back to that concept of intent and intention. Yeah, love, love that. Love that. Do you find it's how easy is it for the leaders that you work with to do that? Um, mm. Because because you, you're unpicking a lot there, aren't you? You're asking them to unpick a lot. So how, how easy is that to do? It's it, well, it's all it's practice, practice, practice. So it starts with awareness, self awareness, connecting with purpose. Like, what's my purpose in this moment? Am I there to like have the answer? And like, because we need, you know, we just have to move quick, or I own the problem. But or am I really genuinely here to help someone else think and keep keep you know problem solving responsibility with them? So connecting with purpose. Then having like, what's the, my, the process I'm going to take? So what are the types of questions that I could ask? And then practice, practice, practice. And so of course it doesn't come easily. And I mean, I, this is such a key component of what I do for a living and how I coach and work with individuals and teams about asking more effective questions. I too ask leading questions all the time, but I'm better <laughs> at hearing it, stopping it. And, re, and, and correcting it so I don't keep bumbling forward and having that self-awareness of what's going on. I mean, it's so ingrained in us to ask a bunch of questions in a row. Or I even I was teaching a workshop recently and um, I was listening in on a practice session and uh, one of the coaches who was practicing was explaining, doing some explaining about why he was gonna ask a question. I said, no, 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 you're doing too much talking. The practice right now is to ask a short, simple question. He's like, well, but I need to teach this before I ask the question. I said, actually, you, you're making an assumption they need your teaching here. Just ask the question. Um, and the person actually didn't, I, I don't think needed that teaching because they were able to answer, answer the question. So we often assume people are more, um, need more of our telling than we than they really do. They just yeah. instead, instead often need some really effective questions. Now, there are times when like telling and teaching and being more directive and instructional are absolutely 100% what's needed to be more helpful in the moment, but we assume too early that people need that from us. Um, whereas how do, they actually, how yeah. do you know when the right time is? Mm, it's, it's about balancing that sense of struggle. So, and you can see it in people, you know? So. We have to be more okay with struggle too. Is struggle is a part of learning. Like if you don't have the, the answer, and I'm using air quotes for those of you who are listening, <laughs> you don't have the answer, that's okay. Like we don't, so, an, answers require thinking. And sometimes that requires not just like imme immediacy, like you haven't figured it out because it, it is a challenge. And so it's okay to have some of, of that struggle. And I think we wanna rescue people too soon. So it's finding that balance between providing a challenge and pushing people into sort of some discomfort and some struggle, but not, but also providing that support. So not, so assessing it when the struggle is getting to be too much, or they are very beginner in their in their learning. Like you don't throw someone in the deep end and be like, "Good luck with the swimming." So so always balancing that challenge and support. So you can see when someone's really struggling or they're just super frustrated. And so that might be the time to say, I, I see you getting stuck here. Um, I'm gonna take my coaching hat off and um, put my teaching hat on for a moment or offer you one, 
way that I might go about thinking about this problem or one resource that you may want to consider. Okay, now I'm going to put my coaching hat on. How does that make you think about your problem? Um, when can I come back to, you know, help you next? Maybe what next steps are you going to take? So letting them have some struggle, but not so much that they get disengaged and sort of give their hands up. But if that's the art of leadership and coaching. It's making that assessment. There's no yeah. like firm rule. Yeah. How about yourself, Lee? What do you, how do you do that? Deal with that? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Katie. I asked the questions. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> All right. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Um, yeah. So I, I think what I, what I found is, is there's, there's, two competing priorities there's the person but then there's also the business priority and some mm. people become obsessed with the business priority that they yeah. need to change something now that they don't have the opportunity to grow and learn themselves yes um and so i think there's, there's two different tensions and i think mm. if, if the business are open enough to allowing people the space then i find it's a lot easier to coach um if the business is not if the business is a bit more pressured and the compelling need is there then then i find the um, the coaching hat sometimes needs to be taken off a little bit sooner, but it's not for the benefit of the person then, it's for the yeah. benefit of the business. Um, yeah. And and that's that for me is the is the biggest challenge in, in businesses now. Yeah. It's not necessarily sustainable what they're doing because they're trying to put out a current fire rather than build the capability for the future. Yeah. Is, is that... Is that a, a, I, 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 observe, I observe the same thing. And so, uh, you know, I don't think it happens overnight. And so what I also try and... When I, when I speak with leaders, I, I try and help them create awareness like uh, of the trade-offs they're making. So they're being intentional about the trade-offs. Like, you know what, today we, we got to keep mowing, but I know that I'm, I'm missing out on a opportunity for developing this person, but I'm doing that intentionally because there's this sense of urgency. Um, or I say, well, what's, what's one way you can have just a smaller element like you know, maybe just a little bit more thinking or opportunity. Um, and, and so as over time that can build as well, but to be aware of the trade-off they're making opposed to blindly and aware that their own answer may not, especially if they're not as close to the work, may not actually be the best or right answer. And so when we speed up because there is this crisis, um, this fire we have to put out right now, we really miss the opportunity for deeper thinking and maybe better thinking. Um, and then get in this like <laughs> vicious cycle that we're always in a fire. And I think too often we get in this habit of seeing everything as crises or fires that have to be put out when in fact, yes, there are some crises and some things that are urgent, but really a lot of things we can take a little bit more time for some deeper thinking on. So how can we slow down and where can we slow down? Yeah, love that. Love that so much. Love that so much. When you were talking during your introduction as well, you mentioned your father. Mm. And, be and before we hit um, hit record, we, we spoke about, and you, you mentioned about how you sign off your emails and, and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and we spoke about human connection. What, ro what role has your father had in in, in this with you? Oh, so my, my father um, passed away four and a half years ago. His birthday um, is actually July 7th, so we'll have just passed. And he was a real inspiration for me throughout my entire life. He actually was uh, disabled at the age of almost 22, um, the, a month before he graduated from college from a severe motorcycle accident. And he was wow. this strapping athletic you know, young man. This is before my time um, and how he overcame that d adversity. And then, and, and has this incredible positive energy and, and ended up achieving so much in his life. And then at the end of his life, he had um, ALS, so lost the ability of his body to move. And that's what he ultimately passed from four and a half years ago. And his motto that, well, there were two things. One of his motto is today's a great day. And how can you anchor on the greatness or good to help lift us up? So not every day is a great day, but if you can find the great or good moments, use those, use those to help bring you forward. Uh, and so I really find great inspiration in that is like, how can we use a sense of positivity and a focus on the things that we can find goodness in as a way to, um, to, to move forward and, and to get through challenging times. And then my parents also had this saying, and I've written about this on my blog about how this is not what we want, but it's what we've got. And so that we, sometimes we can't change how things are happening, but we can change our response. So, you know, you know, I talked a bit about this yeah. as well. There's the event 
which is, it is what it is. And then there's our response to that event. And so we can't necessarily change the event itself, but we can, we have the capability to influence our mindset and our reaction uh, to that event. And, um, and that's, we can, we, we can have control of the life that we want, even if we don't have control of the circumstances surrounding us. And so the, those elements have really inspired me um, on many levels in my life as well. And, and it's why I always say, have a great day because it's like, how can you find greatness in today? Yeah. How do you move forward? Yeah. I think there's so much value in, in those two things there. And it's about, and I think that mm -hmm. that perspective um, is, is a lot of people, some people say oh, I've had a really bad day today, but people haven't had a bad day. They might've had a bad few minutes within a day as well. And the majority of the day might've been neutral, but there might've been some great moments as well, but they, they allow the negative to, um, to, to overshadow. So it, it makes it a bad day. And I think by refro reframing and, and, and focusing on the positive, mm. I think it, it is so powerful. And, and like you said, just there about the, um, the events we can't change, but our reaction is the thing that we can yeah. control yeah. and change. I think is, is, is so key. And we all react differently to the same situation as well. Yeah. Wow. What, so I'm conscious of the time and you're a, you're a, you're a busy girl, Katie. Um, and I could talk to you all day and, and all night, but unfortunately I'm not allowed to. Um, you've said that, so during your introduction, there was a whole host of things that you do. Before we spoke, you, you spoke about a number of things that you do. What do you think you do best? Oh, that is another very provocative question. Um, you know, I think I do best on two things, both, um, thinking deeply, as well as connecting with people. Um, and I think that's what, and I know that's why I've sort of found my career um, sweet spot, because I really love thinking and learning and helping other people think and learn, and then maintaining genuine human connection. And I always have, even my mom says, it's like, it's amazing how many people I've stayed connected with. And I and I do that out of genuine desire for relationship. Um, you know, I've lived in seven countries around the world and I have, friend, I have genuine friends in all of those places. So the marrying of genuine human connection and so the heart as well as deep thinking and learning the mind. And I think that marrying those two is, um, is, yeah. is what I do well and what, well, what, I, and what I'm genuinely passionate about. Yeah, well. that, com that comes across in everything you do, in everything that you write, everything that you put out, and, and every time I get an opportunity to speak to you as well. Um, and I guess probably the, the the most important question that I have for you today, Kate, is what you're having for your tea, your evening meal? Oh, well, that's a good question. I think tonight it will be carnitas tacos is my evening meal. It's wow, what are them? Yeah, well, it's like the, the pork, stewed pork, um, and then uh, in a taco, in a taco uh, tortilla. Amazing. So, yeah, with a yep. little salsa and uh, some uh, guacamole will be on the, 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 the meal for tonight. Yeah, love that. Love that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, you definitely you definitely are a lady of the world, aren't you? I, um, I am. Too. So if 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 more if people wanted to know more about you, where would they go? What would they find? What what would they see? Yeah, great. So my uh, of course connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, um, KBJ Anderson or my handles uh, there of, of Facebook as well. My website is KBJ Anderson. So my married my maiden name was Brian Jones. So KBJ was my nickname, and so Anderson's my married name. So I'm KBJ Anderson. And then more about the book uh, is Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn dot com. And again, if you go to that link, the um, the pre-order or depending on the time that you listen to the order for the audiobook is there as well as the print and the Kindle edition. And you can also learn about these dolls, which Lee's getting to see right now, these Daruma dolls. And I'm excited because on July 14th, I'm going to fill in this Daruma's eye, which means I've completed the goal of producing my audiobook. So I'm really excited to fill in this Daruma's eye. But you can learn more about why those are important to me if you visit my website as well. Oh, love that. Love that. And so when, when is it available on Audible? Do you, the 14th, it's coming out on July, July 14th. It's available for pre-order if you're listening before that, um, but yep. it drops July 14th, which is the book's one year anniversary. And 
Uh, for those of you listening this week of the book's anniversary, um, I have special Kindle deal going on as well for the um, Amazon UK and Amazon US um, markets for 99 cents and 99 pence. You can get the Kindle edition for Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. So a lot of excitement going on around learning and leading and uh, one year of having this book out in the world. So yeah, yes. amazing, amazing. I just want to say, Katie, thank you so much for your time um, this evening chatting to you. Thank you so much, Sam, for, for popping on for the second time. Congratulations on your wedding anniversary. Congratulations on, on everything, on all of your success. Congratulations on the, the one-year anniversary of your book as well. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and, and, and learn from you in, in this period that I have. So I just want to say thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Lee, and may today be a great day. Oh, perfect. Love that. Love that. Thank you.